I do want to say something about the way in which Heidegger defines phenomenology because I, I think it's a very brilliant sort of description of it. Um, and so, so Heidegger, when, when he's describing phenomenology and being in time, but also in the lecture course given a few years before he published Being in Time, and that lecture course is called History of the Concept of Time. Um, Sorry, just to clarify, so being in time is Heidegger's smackdown opus, right? We should probably uh, put that out. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't interrupt you, uh, Jacob. Keep going. Yeah. No, no, you're good. Um, Yeah, being in time is what he's most famous for. Um, Even though he, I mean, he wrote a lot. He has a lot of books. He has a lot of papers. Um, His later work differs a little bit from his early work, but there's also disputes as to how real the turn is. Um, (laughs) The later um, Heidegger and, Heidegger and the early Heidegger, yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm not really um, knowledgeable enough to comment on how, how different those two things are. I'm kind of working my way chronologically through, through some of his work. Um, but um, yeah, in, the, in Being in Time and his earlier lecture course, he, he describes phenomenology by going back to the ways in which the Greeks used the term phenomenon and logo. So he's kind of taking apart the term phenomenology and separating it um, and looking to the, the, the Greek definitions of this. And in the book, Heidegger says that, you know, that the Greeks understood the term phenomenon as um, that, is, this is going to sound very obscure and esoteric, but I'm going to give hopefully an easier to understand description afterward. But um, he says phenomenon is um, that which shows itself in itself. It's oh, the manifest. Typical Heidegger. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the term the, the, the term for the Greeks also carried connotation of um, like bringing something to light and illuminating. Um, and then the logos, Heidegger explains, the Greeks understood um, by the logos something like discoursing, but not just like, not just dialogue and not just a verbal utterance, but it's more of a discursive communication that um, lets something be seen. And so you could think of the logos as words, whether uttered or written down or what have you, um, that point to something. They let something be seen. It's kind of it's bringing something to light. It's bringing the phenomenon to light. And so if we want to understand this in a less obscure and difficult way than Heidegger likes to put things, um, we could say something like, the logos points to the phenomenon in such a way that the phenomenon becomes unconcealed, or the logos allows the phenomenon to come into view by lifting it out of experience in such a way that it can be seen. And so really, it's, it's, it's almost like your, your word should connect with something that can be pointed out in experience, or can can be shown in experience. And so we're not, and he, con- he contrasts this with the idea of um, free floating concepts and words and ideas. Um, and by that, he just means something like, we don't wanna abstract away so much from experience that we're just playing language games. We want our words to be able to meet up with experience in such a way that if I say something, so like in, in some of my papers about meaning, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to point to experience. I'm trying to point to particular experiences and particular moments in particular experiences where maybe someone might find meaning. So I'm not, uh, I, I'm, I'm just trying to bring something into view using words and concepts. I'm glad you said that, Jacob, because in one of your papers, uh, I forget which one, I think you've sort of touched on this, but a question that came to mind was, so from the definition you gave, definition of phenomenology, how does that differ from, let's say, the empiricist tradition or the empiricist approach, which tends to be quite uh, popular these days, especially in the world of artificial intelligence, where you know we think that our epistemology or our knowledge or our truths of the world is revealed purely based on empiricism, which is experiencing, measuring things. And that, you know, in some sense, the mind is a blank canvas and the world just gives us information and input. So from the empirical approach, how does phenomenology differ? Um, 
so phenomenology is going to differ in the sense that, okay, so if we think about the empirical approach specifically as it pertains to, to the sciences, yeah. we're, had, we're, we're, get, we're, we're getting, we're trying to get a collection of experiences that kind of compile and point toward the same sort of thing and experience. Um, now, a major difference, I guess, is going to be what it is we're trying to discern in empirical science as opposed to something like Heidegger's phenomenology or the way that I just described phenomenology. Um, with a scientific and empirical approach, we're looking at, usually looking at objects, um, and we're trying to figure out what sort of properties these objects have. Um, and so, I mean, I get I guess physics or chemistry is a great example of that. And we're trying to see maybe what how two entities interact with each other. Um, and we're going to perform experiments to do that. And we're going to try to replicate the experiments. Um, and we're going to try to not let our first person perspective influence exactly what we're um, investigating. So phenomenology is going to differ from that. In that we're not we're not collecting data and we're not measuring stuff. Um, we're experiencing. We're trying to pay attention to the experience as the as it's experienced. So you're not going to measure your experience of meaning. Say um, you're going to more so um, if you're doing a phenomenology and you're trying to discern maybe what you find meaningful. You're going to more so reflect on um, maybe the way that you feel when you were participating in a certain activity. Um, and from there, you might also start to look at the structures um, of the experience more so than just the feeling of the experience, which might be, um, you know, what's involved in this activity or what's involved in this experience. Um, what are the things that are essential to the experience without which I could no longer say that it was a meaningful experience. Um, those are the sorts of things that phenomena, that sort of questions phenomenology is going to ask, and specifically Heidegger, because specifically for Heidegger, he's wanting to look, he's wanting to discern the a priori structures of it, of existence and experience, which is just to say um, a priori meaning um, always already there. Like what's necessary. What are the what 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 structures are necessary for this to exist or for me to have this particular experience? Yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that for now because otherwise I'm going to get into a really deep. Or you can ask a clarifying question because otherwise I'm just going to go on at the end. No, no, that was perfect, mate. Um, I think in many ways you 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 lead me to my next question. I mean, I, I thought we were going to discuss existentialism too because obviously. It's kind of the, like the precursor, or not the precursor, but it's highly correlated to phenomenology. Uh, but perhaps since we're already on this topic, you, you see, in some sense, I kind of regret even asking that question because I'm coming to realize that maybe it's not fair to ask questions such as, oh, what's the difference or what's the uh, stark difference between uh, phenomenology and science because if you if you think of a field like let's say uh, psychology or cognitive science those fields have had a massive influence by thinkers like uh, Merleau-Ponty or Heidegger by phenomenologists um so well the question I was going to ask is how does phenomenology and I was also going to say existentialism but we didn't, we didn't get to that still but let's let's just say how does phenomenology differ from a more scientific approach but maybe to make things even a bit more interesting, let's 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 talk about, in fact, how does it relate to fields like psychology and cognitive science, where in the world of in, in the scientific approach, what we always try and do is take the remove the subject, so remove the subjective experience. But clearly, it's it's there are some fields even within science where you can't do that. You can't remove the subject from cognitive science or psychology. So maybe to make things a bit more interesting. How how do they correlate? How do they connect to phenomenology? Th those fields I mentioned. Sure, sure. Um, so I'll I, I want to comment on cognitive science just a little bit first, and then I want to maybe dive into a little bit of neuroscience and how phenomenology might be related. Because um, I, I I actually I presented a paper last year at a um, philosophy conference um, hosted by a university in the Czech Republic on this topic of phenomenology and neuroscience. But before I get to that. Um, you know, something that I really appreciate about, 
appreciate about cognitive science is that um, it really embraces the, the subjective experience. Um, and like you said, you can't, re you can't remove that from cognitive science, it's still cognitive science um, necessarily. And uh, I mean, so they're, they're, I think the most prevailing approach in cognitive science right now is 4E cognitive science, and that's just the 4E's. Four, four I always forget one, but I say it's for um, embeddedness, embodied, um, inactive, and I, you know, like I said, I always forget the fourth one. Um, I don't know why, but... Um, I'll leave a know, little a of, uh, little caption or whatever, just to, for our viewers, all good, yeah. Yeah, have, have somebody um, place in the comment. Whatever. Annotate the video, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's um, But... Uh, a lot of the, so a lot of those ideas really I, I mean I believe have an inception in phenomenology I mean they're um, you know especially in Heidegger with Heidegger's idea of um, being in the world you know which which we'll get to um, but it's just this idea that there's a more holistic structure to the world and existence that we need to take into consideration when we're trying to understand things about the world and trying to understand um, things about ourselves and maybe the way in which we interact with the environment. Um, and so I, I, I think phenomenology played at least a role in trying and getting a lot of those ideas going for cognitive science. Um, now, as far as neuroscience goes, um, Anil Seth, I'm sure you've heard of Anil Seth. Yes, I have. Yep, he recently um, wrote a, quite a like a popular science book right on the brain. Mm -hmm. yep. And so he does a lot of work um, trying to um, map the brain correlates of certain experiences. Um, so he's trying to see like what's going on in the brain at a given time um, when someone's having a particular experience, and he, he's trying to build that map out. And you can't build that map if you don't have good phenomenology, um, because if, if, if you if you think just think about if we think about it simply, as far as okay, let's say brain region X lights up when I have experience Y, and let's say we can we can gather all the data we want about the brain structure and we can reproduce it and map it as much as we want, but if we don't have a good description of the experience. We're not going to know what we're mapping this brain activity to. And so in order to have good correlative mapping, we have to have good phenomenology. We have to have like a good description of the experience. And we have to have people, the participants in the study that, that they're studying, trying to get this correlative mapping going. They have to be familiar with the experience, not only as it is experienced, but they have to understand what it is that the neuroscientists are trying to map, like what experience do you want me to have? So then I can tell you when I'm having it so you can, you know, mark down what's going on in, in my brain when I'm having that experience. And so you have to have a whole lot of phenomenology going on. Um, not only the person being, the, the participant being able to recognize the experience and being able to communicate that to the, um, to the researchers, but yes, the, the researchers also have to have a pretty rich phenomenological description of what it is they want their participants to um, experience. And that way they know precisely when the experience has started. Because you might, I mean, there might be like a very important, as far as neuroscience goes, there might be a very important spike in a particular brain region that they are trying to map to a very specific, maybe milliseconds um, of an experience. And if you don't get that right, it's just not going to be correct. Your description is going to be wrong, and your correlative mapping isn't going to mean anything because you 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 might have one side of it, but you're going to be missing the other side of it. 